you said that uh, guys that, with whom you were in prison for a, a long time got to know each other better than they knew their wives. Oh, right. <laughs> Some young pilots were there and they'd been married for three years or, or three months. And they'd gotten shipped off to Vietnam and, and you'd live in this tiny little cell that was maybe um, six and a half feet long by four feet wide. it would be a bunk, put an upper and a lower. And you'd be in that, and you, and you get to know them, and either love or hate the guy, for, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And and and, and often <clears throat> you were put in with somebody with whom you would have no inclination to be a friend with. I mean, he's not a bad guy, but it just had nothing in common. And it's such close quarters. And close, close quarters, and you'd have to make it work, and you and you couldn't. You'd argue it, and you you'd, you'd make POW bets. Oh, listen, I'll bet you five thousand dollars that it was this date. That it was that. He said, "Okay, you're on. Make it ten thousand. Okay, you're on." And we all left the prisons owing thousands and thousands of dollars to the guys for, for making this POW because the only way you could win a, or, or end an argument. Navy Captain Jerry Coffey spent seven years and nine days in captivity after his reconnaissance jet was shot down over North Vietnam in 1966. He got through it by taking it one day at a time and never losing faith that he would be rescued. Jerry Coffey, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Gerald Coffey, better known as Jerry Coffey, is a highly decorated Navy captain who retired in 1985 after 28 years of active military service. Since then, he has taken on many other callings. He's a sought-after motivational speaker in the country. He's a national commentator on political and military issues. And he's the author of a book, Beyond Survival, which draws from insights he gained as a prisoner of war. He also writes a column, Coffee Break, in the local midweek newspaper. Jerry Coffey had not originally planned on spending his career in the military. Instead, he was headed in a very different direction. I was born and raised in Modesto, California. It was a relatively small uh, farming uh, rural area, and uh, everybody knows everybody else, uh, although it wasn't a, a hamlet, but it was a pretty substantial size, small town. It was really um, a, a good place to, to be raised and to call home. And, and uh, great memories of my youth and growing up in Modesto, California. All American youth kind All of All American, experience. exactly, yeah. So you went cruising at night on the, on the main I drive? I went cruising on 10th Street and go around one drive and at one end and the other drive and at the other end. And car hops? Mm, car hops, exactly. Cruising along to a stop, say, hey, Dad, how you doing, girls? Where are you all from? Turlock. <laughs> Turlock, nobody's from Turlock. <laughs> 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 and was it always your plan to go into the Navy? No, no. I went down to UCLA and, um, and majored in art. And uh, <clears throat> as it turned out, I got my draft notice at the same time I got my diploma from UCLA. And I got my physical, military physical, in downtown LA at the, at the City Hall. And that experience caused me to realize I wanted a little more control over my life than just going to the Army. So I looked at alternatives, and naval aviation looked exciting. I liked the looks of the beaches at Pensacola. I spent a lot of time at the beaches in Santa Monica, UCLA. But so, otherwise, you would have been an artist, you think? Uh, of some kind, right? I'm not sure about you know with a palette and all that kind of thing, but but probably an advertising artist, uh, advertising art, hmm. or something like that, or graphic design, perhaps. But here you are, headed to the Navy yeah. and the beaches head, of, head of Pensacola. Head of the Navy, exactly the beaches of Pensacola, and I just loved it. I loved the Navy from the very first week that I was there. What did you love about it? I loved the, I guess I loved the structure and the discipline and the athletics and the challenge of the academics and the, 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 the uh, prospect of flying Navy jets and so on. And, uh, and that's how I made my 28 year Navy career decision because I like the looks of the beaches of Pensacola <laughs> where the training took place. I wasn't joining to fight necessarily, but I like the looks of the of flying jet airplanes off of aircraft carriers and I've never, never been disappointed. Uh, I've embraced the whole thing, and uh, it's, it's it provided an exciting life. It's provided a good income. It's provided security. It's provided experiences that I could, could never have had anywhere else. You're involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. What was that? I mean, that's that was a. I was stationed at Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm and I was in a squadron that flew uh, reconnaissance, tactical reconnaissance missions. When Castro and Khrushchev connived to put. Russian medium-range missiles in Cuba. Um, we got U-2 pictures of it, but then they shot down the U-2s because they had SAM missiles and 
Russian SAM missiles in Cuba also, so they couldn't get any more U-2 pictures, so they decided to bring in the, the tactical recce squadron, and we flew our airplanes down to Key West and planned these, these um, missions out ahead of time in meticulous detail. There were no navigation aids in, in Florida, in, in Cuba, so we had to do it all by dead reckoning. So many minutes on this heading, turn so many minutes on that heading and so on, and then pick up the, your cues from the top topography, whether it be rivers and bridges or sugarloaf mountains or that kind of thing, in order to fly over these missile sites. And so I ended up flying six of those missions, um, uh, and we'd fly out of Key West, Florida, do the mission over Cuba, and then climb out and fly back to, Key, to uh, Jacksonville and load the film, and then go back for another mission, ready for that another mission. And we did that, and we took the pictures that Adlai Stevenson, as our ambassador to the United Nations, was able to use to prove to the world that there were Soviet missiles, intermediate range ballistic missiles, in Cuba. And then it was a cat and mouse game between Kennedy and Khrushchev as of what would, who would win out, and we finally won out by making some concessions, uh, and he removed all the missiles from Cuba. But flying those missions was, was really exciting because of real world stuff, and, and the results were important. And you knew exactly what you were doing as you were doing it. It wasn't something you found out about yeah, later. No, we knew exactly the importance of it at the time. I flew across a, a, a target of opportunity. I was flying this, this when I was flying wingman on my leader up there. And I glance over to the left, and there's a motor pool over there. And so I'm looking at him, and it looks kind of important. So I pull the airplane around and pull real hard and make that sharp turn and roll wings level and take pictures as I go across it and catch up with my lead. And as it turned out, when they interpreted those, those photographs, they saw for the first time in Cuba a tracked vehicle that had a missile on it. And it was called the Frog missile. And they were nuclear tipped. And until that moment, they didn't know that they were in Cuba. And so we, our Marines had to change their entire concept of an amphibious invasion of Cuba because if, they'd had, if they hadn't known about those nuclear-tipped missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, they would have been decimated. And so I got a nice letter of commendation from the Commandant of the Marine Corps saying, never in the history of the Navy-Marine partnership of the intelligence of such importance gathered. Way to go, Coffey, that kind of thing. Jerry Coffey, who was 28 years old at that time, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his daring missions over Cuba. Four years later, in 1966, he was sent on another reconnaissance mission, this time over North Vietnam, where his plane was shot down and he was captured. You had to um, abort flight. You jumped out. You got e you ejected. Broke your arm along the way, I believe. I did. Mm -hmm. Into and you yeah. landed in water yes. and approaching <clears throat> gunships. Yes, and so um, I, I had to eject at very very high speed, and the airplane was totally out of control, rolling rapidly. I was knocked unconscious immediately, but regained consciousness floating in the water, and already some Vietnamese small Vietnamese boats and and militia men and, and army guys were there, and, and I was I was captured immediately. We got to the beach finally and jumped out and ran across a wide sandy beach and dove behind a rice paddy dike to take cover just about the same time that an A-4 Skyhawk from the Kitty Hawk rolled in and fired a pack of rockets, which blew all those beach boats to splinters. That was my introduction to North Vietnam. So, and I found myself a, a prisoner of war, a POW. And it takes a while to, to get, to, to, we used to say, so that way you get to know the ropes. But the ropes were how they tortured us. <laughs> Early on, there's this uh, really vivid scene that, that you describe in your book where, you were with your broken arm and a, I think a shattered elbow. You were tied up uh, with your arms and back. That's right, to a tree. And yeah. to a tree, and you, essentially you became it was, you became a game of tether ball to yes, some exactly. Vietnamese the on the ground. Yes, exactly. On a hill, and they, the guards kept pushing me downhill, and all the weight was on my on my arms. Uh, I was tied to a, up a branch of the tree, <clears throat> and I didn't. I was so naive. I mean, I was a professional naval officer, military officer, and I didn't even realize it didn't really register to me that I was being brutally tortured at the time. It wasn't until I had a chance to kind of catch my breath and land on a stack of hay in this stable, which was near in this little village in, in central North Vietnam, and I just realized, oh, God, I've just been tortured. You know, and it's, such a, it's such a foreign, rare concept in our uh, normal Were you being tortured for information or just for sport? For information, they wanted to know what, what carrier I had flown off of. And ironically, the name of the aircraft carrier was painted on the side of my airplane. And if they just get the wreckage, they'll know. But you know, I could only use my name, rank, 
serial number and date of birth. And he began, he began answering all of the questions to the utmost of my ability. And so <clears throat> I gave him my name and my name, Reverend Rank, and I finally had to tell him, USS Kitty Hawk, that's all I wanted to know. What, air, what aircraft carrier was I flying from? And they already knew that. It was just a matter of breaking me down and to be, you know, a, a, a form of surrender to their, to their power and their authority. Well, you thought it was maybe 20, 30 minutes that they were, I mean, you were, you were held in that horrible position with a broken it, arm it and was. bad sh elbow and being But even after you said, okay, batted. okay, 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 I'll give up. I, I'll tell you, but we keep going just so you didn't forget the next time. Did you have any faith that they weren't going to kill you, they were just going to make you suffer horrible pain? Yes, I did. And one of the things that they told me in survival training school was no matter how they threaten you, they probably won't kill you because you represent something of value to them. And that's exactly why they kept us alive, because we did. We were propaganda resources. You had to be so strong. I mean, you were in this tiny little cell. It was just filthy and unsanitary, and you never knew when you were going to get called into the next session. Exactly. And everything, and be, as you described that cell, you, you, you always, everything that happened to you got infected because of the environment in which we were living. And, um, but an infection could have killed you. Yeah, it could have, and did kill some men. The toilet was a, a bucket without a, bucket a cover right there, in this yeah, very small right, space, right. and you <clears throat> exercised in that tiny little space. Right. How many miles a day did you walk? Three at miles. Three a, steps at a time. <clears throat> three miles a day, three steps at a time. One of the first things you do when, when you move into a new cell, and the cells did vary sometimes in size, but you'd walk it off <clears throat> and see many, how many laps it had to be for a mile. And you'd go get your exercise, and you'd do push-ups on, on this concrete bump and bunks and, and stay in as good a shape as possible, because you never knew the next day was going to require. You always looked at the, the brighter side. You thought, <laughs> isn't it amazing? I, you know, I can survive with this horribly mangled arm. I mean, I'm doing pretty well here. I'm pretty resilient. Yeah, I'm carrying this bucket of water back and forth yeah, in I, my I, cell. <laughs> I may have a right angle elbow for life, but, it, but I'm alive. I'm alive, exactly. Besides surviving physically, Jerry Coffey had to deal with the psychological stress of being a prisoner of war. Did you have a family? Yeah, I married a high school sweetheart from Modesto. And when I was shot down, I had my daughter and two older sons. I didn't even know that I had a young son until about three years into the prison experience. They, they screwed up and gave me a letter from home one time. And my, my wife was telling me about the weather in Florida and how Kim, our daughter, skis all around the lake and the boys swim like fish and Jerry jumps off the dock. I said, Jerry. Your name, <laughs> Jerry name. Jr. Yeah, exactly. And, and we'd never planned that either. Um, so that was how I found out I had a, a fourth child. What are some of the other positive attributes that helped you mark that uh, torturous, literally, time? Uh, well, you know, early on, Leslie, uh, uh, my, my prayers changed from why me to show me. And I quit saying, why me, God? And I started saying, show me, God. How can I use this positively? Help me to use it to go home as a better, stronger, smarter man in every possible way that I can, to go home as a, as a better naval officer, to go home as a better American, a better citizen, a better Navy pilot, a, a better Christian, uh, every possible way. God, help me to use this time productively so that it won't be some kind of a void or a vacuum in my life. And after, after that change in my prayers, every single day took on a new meaning because now there was something to, to learn about myself or about the men and other cells around me or about communism or about the little geckos that I was sharing my cell with and, or about the, the moths that caught the gecko and shoved him into the hole in the corner of my wall like that. There's always something new. Doing memory work, mem memorizing the books of the Bible in order, memorizing the names of over 560 other American prisoners, all alphabetically, going over them frequently, re remembering poetry, reciting poetry, composing poetry, um, planning an escape. Never had an opportunity to do it, but every man had his own escape plan. And, and every time you were moved to a different part of the prison or a different prison, you'd have to go back and replan another escape. Attempt. How did your belief in God change as you were in prison? It became very internalized. It didn't depend on going to church. It didn't depend on going to mass. It didn't depend on having a rosary to say. It was very internalized. And early on, I saw scratched on the wall of the cell by another American who had been there in that little cell before me, two words with an equal sign. God equals strength. God equals strength. That for me, that really worked. I was never, ever totally alone. I could always find a little bit more strength when I needed it. 
To me, that was the key. Keeping faith in myself, faith in my fellow Americans, my family, faith in America, and faith in God. Those are the four aspects of faith that guaranteed my survival. And I know you tended to view time in small increments because the idea of, if you, had, if you looked at it from the outset as seven years, it would have been really hard to, if harder I, if, to if take. If I had known for some, somehow that I was going to be there for seven years, Leslie, I don't know what I would have done. I don't really know how that would have affected many of us. So it was, I'm only here for six months. I can yeah. make it six months. I'll be home next And then Christmas. another six months. Next birthday, we'll be home. Next Halloween, I'll be home. You know, whatever it is, I'll be home. I'll be home. Never, ever lost hope that I'd come home. It was just you and yourself. Well, we do a lot of communicating on the wall for the guys on either side of your cell, but, but you didn't often have a, a, a cellmate, but you could communicate. You did mention the communication system, and that's so fascinating because it was <laughs> such a, a bonding and a, also a source of uh, protection and vigilance for, for the prisoners of war. You used a, a sort of alphabet matrix, uh, five yes. columns of letters. Five, it was, we based it on, on 25 letters of the alphabet through a way that it, letter K because you could use a C interchangeably. It would make the same sound enough at the time. And then we arranged those remaining 25 letters in five rows of five letters each. I could spell out words that way. We were actually texting. And then, you know, and, and our, our sign off at night was GB, which meant God bless you. And then GB, GBA, God bless America. And it would be G, B, A, God bless America. G, B, you, the letter U, God bless you. And you didn't just use tapping, you used other ways to, Otherwise, to yeah. use the sounds. Yeah. Sneezing? Yeah. Sneezing, we had something called vocal tap. A cough was for one, and two sniffs was for two, a throat clear was three. I was in a courtyard waiting to be interrogated one time, and a guard was right there in front of me. He had me under, under control, everything was fine. But through a high window in the cell next to this little courtyard, a guy was coughing and sneezing and hacking and spitting and sputtering. And he's telling me that just before he'd been shot down, Green Bay Packers had won the Super Bowl. Mm. And this was the first Super Bowl. I didn't even know what the Super Bowl was. When we got word that uh, we'd landed a man on the moon. That was exhilarating. You know, I was, I was being interrogated, and I was, and the interrogator had lift. He would put me down on my knees to contemplate my crimes, but I was right next to the door that had louvers that looked through, and you could look down at the ground, and I saw the feet of a, of a GI. And I said, Psst, hey, who are you? What's your name? And I got his name. I introduced myself. He said, hey, did you hear we went to the moon? No. Yeah, a guy named Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. <clears throat> and then he, then he had to quit because a guard came. And I'm thinking, oh my God. So I could hardly wait to get back to the cell block <clears throat> and call up the guy next door, you know, and say, hey, we'll put a man on the moon. And then <clears throat> we started getting a little bit more information from the new guy shot down. But that was exhilarating. But on the other hand, you think, God, if we can put a man on the moon, why can't we beat these guys in the war? Why can the war still go on? What was the answer to that, to yourself? That was a big question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. The Vietnam War finally did end, and Jerry Coffey was released and sent back home to America in 1973. He returned to his career as a naval officer and was able to continue where he left off. But there were new personal challenges that would not be as easy to overcome. Were you ready for to resume life as you'd known it? I think so. Um... There were some things that took a little bit getting used to, some mundane things like everybody's toilet water was blue, <laughs> <laughs> tidy bowl, mm -hmm. and, and uh, <clears throat> catching up on, on things that had happened in our families, you know, all my, my grandfathers had all passed away and, and um, other you know, new babies born and things like that, and, and reading the headlines from newspapers, kind of catching up in general. And um, the Navy, really bent over backwards to give us whatever we wanted to do, if it made any sense at all. And there was an ongoing master's program at some of the major universities in, in America that the Navy would send their officers to throughout as a, as a routine course. And uh, so they sent me to Berkeley, UC Berkeley, for two years. And uh, I thought, oh, I figured if I could handle seven years in a communist prison, I could hack two years at Berkeley to, a, yeah, bring it on, let's go. <laughs> And so those are two very pleasant years, low pressure years, and, and uh, studied political science. We lived in Walnut Creek in a beautiful little home there, and life was idyllic, 
frankly. And, and I couldn't have asked for two warmer, more embracing or, or better years for, for my family than those two years. Then my first orders after that were to command a squadron at Barber's Point, Hawaii. And so um, we packed up and came out here. We lived at Barber's Point. It was very insular and, and uh, spent two years out there. And after that, I went to the National War College at uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, for a one-year course studying um, all the kinds of polit political things and, and economics and things that all combined to, to make our national defense, uh, whether it be military or economic, industrial, and so on. And then after that, uh, came back to Hawaii and I've been here ever since. So what were some of the uh, challenges? I mean, you mentioned some of the wonderful things. That, I mean, you, you, the Navy invested in you and you had some great family times and education. What didn't go as well as a result of what you'd endured? Well, my marriage didn't go that, that well. I was after, we had about uh, 10 or 12 very, very happy years. But um, <clears throat> I think because my personal priorities were so um, touched by the, by the sense of responsibility to make that experience count for something positive, and I'd begun to learn that the speaking, that I could share the message that would try to convince people that uh, the things that I did, they could have done too, the same training and orientation going in. And um, <clears throat> as one of my, one of my senior officers in, in prison said it, Air Force Colonel Robbie Reisner, he said, all the years I was gone, I was in idle. But my wife was an afterburner, going like that, being all things to everybody and being the best mother and father she could be. And, and uh, when I came home, she was ready for idle. Her tongue was hanging out, and I was ready for afterburner. And there, for, for many of us, there was a disparity of pace and priorities in, the, in those early years that we just couldn't reconcile. Just but that, that was the, generally the issue. It wasn't uh, what you'd endured. It wasn't the, the absence that changed you. Well, yes, it was the absence, too, because you know, during those seven years, we both were growing in different directions, and they didn't happen to coincide. So it was a combination, Leslie, of, of the two things, the, the growing apart of pace and priorities and, and feeling uh, that I had to do something to fulfill my sense of responsibility to make that experience count for something, uh, to share the lessons learned. And I was driven to do that. And I, and, and I might have been able to save my marriage, I'm not sure. But um, So it didn't happen right away, but your no, marriage no, did we, come to a stop. Ultimately, right. Ultimately, it did. The marriage ended. It didn't fail. You can't have a failed marriage that produces great kids, I don't think. And, um, and I stayed in close touch with my kids and with, with my ex-wife, and, and um, she's thrived, and I've thrived, certainly. You still both live in Hawaii. We do. And, and you've remarried since? Mm -hmm, I've remarried, and, and as I, I said earlier on, maybe I don't know if we were still filming at that time, but you know, I, all those years in prison, I couldn't even fantasize about how good my life was going to be someday, how many blessings I've we, I, I live a, a life of gratitude and grace for everything that goes on in my life. Um, Dennis Prager says, happiness is directly proportional to gratitude. Makes me the happiest guy I know. <laughs> you know, really, because I'm so grateful for our blessings and for the, to be able to survive the experience and have that experience and to be able to capitalize on it and make it count for something positive as well. What are some of the um, attributes that you think made each of those who, who survived and, and later did well in life? What, what were some of the common attributes that you, sh you all shared? I think optimism. And it, it costs no more to be an optimist than it does a pessimist. And, and it's a lot happier way to live your life, I think. But those who were the most optimistic and, and, and could translate that optimism to faith or through faith, I think that they were the ones that were able to make the most of the experience and learn the most and be able to make the biggest contribution because of the experience after we returned. I think that um, guys who uh, were mechanically minded also that could be inventive and, and guys came up with some of the most remarkable things, not the least of which was learning how to put our, our sandals to balance them on the edge of the top of the, of the bucket to sit down on the sandals instead of the edge of the bucket? I mean, a toilet seat. <laughs> how, how come I didn't <laughs> figure this out earlier? Any thoughts about man's inhumanity to man? Oh, yeah. You, you, while I was in prison, I thought about that a lot. 
And, um, in, you know, at the, in the preface of my book, I'm talking about how I need to do better. The war is not inevitable, I don't think, and, and we just need to keep evolving in positive increments uh, so that we can do better in the future. I think you've said uh, peace starts with you as an individual. You've got to have peace yeah, in yourself. Ex exactly. Yeah, you do. And, uh, and, and peace of mind, certainly. And, and I'm just, I think that that experience was life-changing for me, obviously, as it was for every one of us. And it just depended upon, it's like, like any adversity. You decide what you want to do with it. Your attitude makes it different. And I hate to sound like a motivational speaker. Which you <laughs> are. Me, but, but I am, but it's really attitude. You, know, you, you actually, you have, you have control, you're not victimized. And you can make anything you want out of something, usually. And I, you know, and, I, and I've, I've been, I've dodged a lot of bullets. I've, I always spoke down on, on Waikiki one day to a, about 500 clerical workers of the state, a lot of little old ladies. And when this little old Filipino lady came up and said after she says, Captain, I need to tell you, I've been blessed with the opportunity to see angels. And you have leagues of angels, hordes of angels around you protecting you. And I said, yeah, boy, I sure believe you because I've had a lot of protection. Jerry Coffey is 80 years old at the time of this conversation in 2014. Despite health issues in recent years, he's still going strong, continuing to inspire others. Mahalo to Jerry Coffey of IAEA Heights for his sacrifices for our country and for sharing his stories and insights with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. It occurs to me, Jerry, that you're a conservative in one of the most liberal states in the country, a, a state that, um, you know, where, where Barack Obama, whom you do not support, was born. But you feel really comfortable here. You love it here. I, I try, I compartmentalize. <laughs> and guess what? I learned how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love Hawaii and I love the, the spirit of aloha. To me, the spirit of aloha is tangible. and. Um, my family loves it. We're all on the same frequency there. Um, and, and yet, I know politically Hawaii is very liberal. And that's why I get so, many, so much flack in the letters section of midweek. <laughs>